everybody. Welcome. My name is Kristen Anderson. I'm the executive director of the Walnut Creek Library Foundation. And I want to remind everyone to turn off their cell phone. This is my prop that I'm turning off myself because I forget to. Um, welcome to our first event for the 2012 One City, One Book program. And before we begin, I just want to take a moment of silence in remembrance of the people who lost their lives 11 years ago today. Thank you very much. And I am glad we're together on this day. And we're really excited to have Jeff Shara with us and to discuss the Killer Angels and the Civil War. And we have more One City, One Book programs coming up. Next, we have the Civil War in 3D on September 19th at the Walnut Creek Library. You received a flyer when you came in that lists all of the One City, One Book events, so please look at that when you get home. And also turn it around. And on the back, it talks about a wonderful exhibit that we have coming to the Walnut Creek Library in December, Lincoln, the Constitution, and the Civil War. We're very privileged and excited to have this exhibit coming to the library, and we have a whole bunch of other programs that are going to be there in January, and the exhibit runs until February 8th. I'd like to, uh, oh, we have an open house on December 14th, so I hope you come at the library. And then Kevin Starr, who's the former state librarian, is going to be here at the Lesher Center on January 6th, so I hope that you come back for that event. I want to thank the sponsors for making tonight possible. Um, Hanson Bridget Law Firm, the Contra Costa Times, Minuteman Press of Lafayette, and also the Marriott and Walnut Creek. And this program is also made possible by our many donors and a fabulous group of volunteers on the One City, One Book Committee, so I want to thank all of them for their time and their energy. Um, the Friends of the Walnut Creek Library and Ignacio Valley Library, the Contra Costa County Library, the Rossmore Library, lots of good library people, and also the American Association of University Women. Um, Mr. Shar's books will be on sale after the event. He'll be signing books. You received cards when you came in, so you can pass them to your left. The ushers will collect them and give them to our moderator, so there's a Q&A after the talk. And we hope that you have some wonderful questions for Mr. Shara. So I'm pleased to introduce our moderator for this evening. It's, um, his name is Gary Hernbroth, and he's the Chief Motivating Officer of Training for Winners, a firm he founded in 1995 after an 18-year career in the hospitality industry. Gary's a professional speaker, trainer, and facilitator with clients across the country and Canada. He's a graduate of the Michigan State's University School of Hospitality Business and currently serves on their alumni board of directors. Like our guest, Jeff Shara, Gary developed his interest in history and particularly the Civil War at an early age when he was an elementary school student and his parents gave him the book the American Heritage Picture Book of the Civil War, and he, after that he was hooked, as I'm assuming a lot of you are too. Gary's visited many Civil War battlefields, including 13 trips to Gettysburg, and he's developed a business program that his company offers entitled Battlefield, Battlefields to Business, which takes adult groups and corporate managers to historical sites to study the lessons of history so they can apply them in today's business arena. So thank you again for coming, and please join me in welcoming, welcoming Gary. Good evening, Walnut Creek, and wherever you came from. I'm really excited about being here this evening. This has been a special evening on my radar for several months. This promises to be an outstanding evening, and I'm extremely honored to moderate this program and introduce our very special guest tonight. By way of backstory, if I can indulge you for a minute, it turns out that Jeff Shara and I have a bit in common. As we were each bitten by that Civil War bug, whatever that is, when our dads took us to Gettysburg for the first time as youngsters. Jeff writes in his books about walking with his dad through the long, quiet, windswept fields of Pickett's Charge, as I also did as an eighth grader with my dad, and then again with my own son many years later. Experiencing the aura of that battle, from the actual ground upon which it was fought, we realized that no history book, no matter how well written, can substitute for that overwhelming first-person feeling of getting out of the car and walking the fields of battle, climbing those mammoth rocks just like the troops did. We closed our eyes and imagined we were soldiers back in the summer of 1863. A big part of Jeff Shara's success as a writer to me is that he starts each of his books 
with a promise to us readers. And those of you who have read his books, you know the promise. He says he hopes to have written a good story for us. Well, personally, I've found that to be a promise fulfilled. Jeff takes factual historical events from the pages of our American history, what some people unfortunately might call dry, old, forgotten, and irrelevant places and conflicts, and brings them back to life with living, breathing, vibrant people and suspenseful storylines, even though we know how it's going to turn out. It's no easy, fa no easy uh, task. Our guest tonight doesn't whitewash history. He doesn't trivialize it. He doesn't sanitize it for our protection. He honors it. Jeff interprets the real deal, and he brings us both men immortalized in marble and also the regular frontline folks back to living color and makes them breathe again with a you are there story and flesh and blood characters you will care about. He doesn't change history. He awakens it. At least he does for me. As such, by reading his books, I have felt myself desperately firing a musket behind the stone wall at Bunker Hill, trying to hold off the redcoats as they made their way up the hill. I've crawled on my belly in the wet sand and gore of Omaha Beach as a German tracer bullet zinged over my head. And I have held on for dear life in the belly of a B-24 as enemy flak toward our plane before we could make our jump over Italy. If you've read Jeff's novels, you know what I mean. If you haven't, and your interest in history was squelched back in Mrs. Englethorpe's fifth grade somewhere, <laughs> grab a story and hold on. Now, the Civil War's 150th anniversary, which is four years going, is certainly keeping Jeff Shara on the airline frequent flyer lists. Immediately following his 24-hour visit to our fair city of Walnut Creek, he boards a plane and returns back east where he will be part of the 150th anniversary commemorating America's bloodiest single day, the Battle of Antietam. He covers this battle in his first book, Gods and Generals. The subject of his current bestseller and the first of a new trilogy on the Western theater of the Civil War is entitled A Blaze of Glory, and it honors the 150th anniversary of the Battle of Shiloh. Jeff, we may not have any Civil War battles in this immediate area, but we are nonetheless passionate about our nation's history and the legacy we'll leave to the next generation. And we appreciate you coming here tonight to share your thoughts with us. Please join me in giving Jeff Shara a warm Northern California welcome. Oh, there are a lot of you. That's very nice. Thank you. I get the big thing. Um, thank you for coming. Uh, I think it's interesting. I, he just sort of struck me what he said at the end there that you don't have any Civil War battles here, um, but you know maybe you'll care a little bit about what I have to say or what my father wrote about. Um, in fact, my father would make the point very clearly that it really doesn't matter if you had any Civil War battlefields in your backyard to be interested not in the names, dates, places, facts, and figures, but in a good story. And what Michael Shara did, because this is ultimately what I'm, what I'm here to talk about, is the Killer Angels. That's what the library program is about. And I want to touch on this very right off the bat, because it's very important to understand. What Michael Shara did with the Killer Angels is he changed the way a lot of Americans looked at the Civil War. I mean, he was the first man to do something that was controversial. It was very certainly unique. What Michael Shara did, I mean, think about historical fiction. Most historical fiction is a real place with fictitious characters. I mean, most any book you think of, you know, All Quiet on the Western Front or Red Badge of Courage, you know, it's a real place, real events, fictitious characters. What Michael Shara did is he took you to the battlefield at Gettysburg, not with just any characters or fictitious characters, but with real historical figures. And not just any historical figures, he took you there in the minds from the points of view of the people whose decisions made that history. The people who changed what happened at Gettysburg. Why we know of Gettysburg today. Names you know, Robert E. Lee, James Longstreet, Joshua Lawrence Chamberlain. I mean, these are the people who made the history. He put words in their mouths and told you the story the way they would tell it. Nobody had ever done that before. And he caught a lot of grief for it. 
There is, you know, every university, major university history department has the Civil War guy. You know, I mean, there's the, you know, the Roman guy and the Napoleon guy and the British Civil War guy and the medieval guy. And there's the Civil War guy. Well, Florida State University, where my father was teaching creative writing, they had the Civil War guy in, in the history department. This man said to my father when The Killer Angels was published in 1974, this is a book that never should have been written. <laughs> they were not friends. <laughs> in April of 1975, a year later, something marvelous happened. A telegram came to my father's house. Congratulations, The Killer Angels has been awarded the 1975 Pulitzer Prize for Fiction. Now, I don't know if my father took that over to the history department <laughs> at Florida State and, you know, they still weren't friends. But the problem with 1975, and those of you who are old enough to remember, what's going on? End of the Vietnam War. Absolutely nobody in this country wanted to read a book about generals. It was about as out of fashion a subject as you could come up with. My father was a master of bad timing. <laughs> and even with a Pulitzer Prize, The Killer Angels was never a commercially successful book. That was a bitter disappointment to a man who knew better. He knew what a good story was, and he knew what he had done, and it seemed like nobody else cared. Well, Michael Shara was started his career as a sci-fi author in the 1950s. You know, those of you who you remember maybe the names like uh, Isaac Asimov and Ray Bradbury and Robert Heinlein, I mean, the big names of sci-fi in the 50s, my father was one of those people. He published 70 short stories in the, the old pulp magazines of the day, and that's what he was known for. People have always, and I, I get this a lot, people are always asking me, what other historical works did Michael Shara write? They want more. None. There was no audience when he wrote The Killer Angels, and prior to that, I mean, he'd wrote, written a sort of a Korean War prize fighter story. That was his first book. Nobody read that. A uh, very depressing book. Um, and then after The Killer Angels, again, he didn't find an audience. There was no publisher wanting him to write a prequel and a sequel, anything like that. He went on to write other things. He wrote a Hitchcock sci-fi novel that absolutely nobody read. And then he wrote another story, which I'll close this out by talking about, but nothing historical. The Killer Angels was it. And it was a bitter disappointment to him that nobody cared. Well, actually, it became called, this is a terrible thing to have happened to your book, it became labeled a cult book. Now, there's no positive way to say that. Well, if you were in the military, if you went to West Point, or any military academy in this country, you read the book. It was required for all officers. Uh, if you were command and staff in Leavenworth, those of you in the military, you know what I'm talking about, Carlisle Barracks. I mean, if you were, you know, those places, it was required reading. Or if you were a Civil War buff, die hard. And there were some in the 70s, there weren't a lot, but there were some. Yeah, they, they read the book, that was it. Well, in 1993, actually 92 is when it started, Ted Turner was given a copy of The Killer Angels by a man you've heard of named Ken Burns. It was at a party in honor of Ken Burns, of his enormous success with his Civil War series on PBS, and Ted Turner was there, and Ken Burns said to Ted Turner, I've got a book you need to read. And there's a man out in Hollywood trying to get a movie made out of this book. And that's how Ted Turner found out about the Killer Angels, and Ted Turner put up $22 million of his own money to produce what was called by everybody under Ted at TNT, Ted's Folly. Because Ted's got this thing about the Civil War, and he's going to go spend all his own money and throw it down a hole to make this movie. Well, the movie was always to be called The Killer Angels, based on the book. 
You know, you ever been in a mall and you see these people standing there with clipboards and you walk by and they ask you marketing questions and stuff? Well, Atlantic Square Mall in Atlanta, Turner's, you know, the underlings at TNT were very nervous about a movie called The Killer Angels. And so they sent these marketing people out and they asked people, we're, we're making a movie called The Killer Angels, what do you think it's about? And the response they got, which they brought back to Ted, primarily was that it was about biker gangs. <laughs> and they convinced Ted that, well, maybe there's a better title we can put on this movie. And Ted made the decision himself to change the title of the film from The Killer Angels to Gettysburg. Now, when my family heard this, I, well, I, I heard it, I got a phone call and was told that Ted has changed the title of the, uh, of the film. I felt like I'd been kicked in the stomach because I felt like that's the end of any connection anybody will make between the book and the movie. And boy, was I wrong. When Gettysburg premiered in October of 1993 at the National Theater in Washington, and I was there with my mother sitting next to me, um, half of Congress was there, which was an interesting experience, and people all around me in the dark um, are grousing because, oh, you know, Ted twisted my arm and said I needed to come to this thing. And I mean, this is pe people in the cabinet. I mean, this is an amazing bunch of people around me. And at intermission, these same people are saying, wow, this is great. And people were saying, oh, four-hour movie, oh, maybe I can sneak out. At intermission, they're like, God, I can't wait for the rest of this. It worked. And one of the people in the audience, and I've never understood this, was Jacques Cousteau. <laughs> now, if you don't know who Jacques Cousteau is, it just means you're young. Um, why, who knew Jacques Cousteau was a Civil War buff? Um, the film was enormously successful. Played around the country, then it played on TNT. When it aired on TNT the first time, it was seen by 33 million people. That is the highest rated film ever on cable. Well, I got a phone call. I was representing you know, my father's estate. I get a phone call um, from Random House in New York telling me, congratulations. Well, thank you, I appreciate that. And I thought they were talking about the film. No, they were talking about the fact that The Killer Angels was number 14 on the New York Times bestseller list, 19 years after it was published, and five years after my father's death. He had his second heart attack in 1988. He was 59 years old. He was a four-pack-a-day man. He didn't live to see the film. Well, The Killer Angels, number 14 on the Times list, then spends four weeks at number one, 19 years after it was published. Remarkable thing. Well, Turner's people, of course, they're all excited about this. Now, Ted's folly is not such a folly after all. And uh, they come to me and they say, you know, Ted wants to make more movies. Wouldn't it be great to take your father's book, which is just Gettysburg, go in both directions, before and after, and, you know, we'll make more movies? Sounds like a good idea to me. Um, who's going to write this? And I thought about it for a while and thought, Maybe this is something I'd like to try to do. And it's not false modesty to stand up here and tell you I'd never written anything before. I was a dealer in rare coins and precious metals in Tampa, Florida. I know all about the gold market and all that stuff. Well, I wish that I'd been in the gold market today. I thought it was something I'd like to try to do. And I had, you know, no expectations. People ask me a lot, weren't you afraid? How did you know how to write a book? I had no clue. But it was always about Ted making movies. The whole idea is I'll do the kind of research my father did, and I'll talk about that in a second. I'll go out and do the research, put a story together that someone else will adapt for a screenplay. It was always about being a film. And we actually had the conversation, if whatever I write stinks, 
It'll go in the trash. Nobody will ever see it. So there was no risk and no, no expectations and no fear. So I put a story together representing my father's estate, business manager of my father's estate. So I'm talking to Random House, who has this number one bestseller now, so they take my phone calls. <laughs> and I'm talking to the publisher, and I'm telling her, yeah, I'm writing the prequel to The Killer Angels. Um, it's called Gods and Generals. And she said, send us the manuscript. OK, send them the manuscript. The phone call I got back was, in fact, it was, wow, it was um, 17 years ago this month. The phone call I got back was, we don't care if it's a movie. We like the book. We think you're a writer. Here's a contract. <laughs> that changed my life. And that's not exaggeration. My life changed at that minute. Gods and Generals comes out and debuts on the bestseller list. Now, I'm under no illusions that the great American author has arrived. I know full well that people want more of the Killer Angels. I'm getting cut slack all over the country by critics. It's like people are rooting for this to work. I mean, it was amazing. I mean, I was through here. The publisher sent me out on a 59-city, 59-city book signing tour. To, and, and the idea was to put me out. They told me this. We're going to put you out. Not Michael Shara, the son. That's what they. That's what they told me. So I'm, you know, I'm in Half Moon Bay, and, and there's a great bookstore down there, and Corte Madera, and you know, around here, um, and a place in Berkeley that's out of business now, and you know, and I, I was all over the place, and everywhere I went, you know, there's the feature section in the Sunday paper, you know, just it would be local, whatever. My face is on the cover of these things everywhere. And I can't tell you how many times I saw the headline, for you Hemingway buffs, the sun also rises. <laughs> well, you know. And then in Gettysburg, I go to Gettysburg to do an event, you know, to, and I was there for a week, and in Gettysburg, the Gettysburg Times made a big deal out of me there, and, and again, I get to Gettysburg, and here's my face this big on the front page of the paper with the headline, Son of Killer Angels Returns to Gettysburg. <laughs> and it was my sister who pointed out, you know what that sounds like, don't you? It sounds like the sequel to a slasher movie, you know, like you know, Son of Killer Angels. Well, my life got very surreal very quickly. The problem now, of course, is they want the sequel, the after. Gods and Generals is the prequel. Now we gotta go afterward. Now there are expectations. Now there's a publisher in New York saying, how are you coming with that thing? You know, you done yet? Um, I, you know, the, the old cliche, one hit wonder. I was wondering, am I a one hit wonder? Um, Last Full Measure comes out, same thing, and I'm off and running with a career in writing that seriously overshadows what my father did, but not what he created. My father was his own worst enemy. He was, when, when the Killer Angels received the Pulitzer Prize, he was invited to be on Good Morning America. Logical. He turned it down. Uh, I have to go to New York, get up early. <laughs> well, you know, the marketing people at Random House, you know, are berserk over that, but that was my father. You know, he wanted to write. One of the reasons why he never wrote more than one story of the same kind, I love the line, I don't want to write what they want me to write. I want to write what I want to write. Okay, that means you're not going to sell any books. And that's exactly what happened to him. All the way through this process, I mean, I've learned some lessons. One of the enormous benefits of growing up in the house of a storyteller is being told stories. And I learned, and I understand this now, I didn't understand at the time, the way my father would write is he would talk it first. He would have to put it into words, verbalize it. Well, you know, my sister and I, we're the kids at the dinner table you know, we're listening to the old man tell the story of Joshua Chamberlain on Little Round Top. 
or Pickett's charge. And we're hearing this, and what he's doing is he's forming it in his own brain before he could ever put it on paper. I understand that now, exactly. But at the time, had no idea. All I know is we were getting, you know, the old man was a terrific storyteller. He would tell his creative writing students at Florida State, he taught creative writing, and the first thing he would tell them is, first of all, I can't teach you creative writing. You know, if you get an A in this class, it doesn't mean you're going to go out and be a published author. It's about telling a story. You know, there's a cliche in, in the journalism business, I suppose, and it applies to creative writing. Show it, don't tell it. Well, that's what my father did. He showed you the Battle of Gettysburg. One critic wrote a wonderful line. He said, I wanted to know what it smelled like. Well, Michael Shara told you what it smelled like, showed you what it smelled like. I had somebody say to me, how dare you put words in the mouth of Robert E. Lee? Actually, it was more like, how dare you, sir? You know, one of those guys. <laughs> I look like Colonel Sanders, you know, <laughs> in Virginia. And, oh, oh, okay, challenge accepted. If I dare to put words in the mouth of Robert E. Lee or George Washington or Benjamin Franklin or Winfield Scott or Ulysses Grant or Black Jack Pershing or the Red Baron or Dwight Eisenhower or Winston Churchill, I had better believe that those words are authentic to the character. If I don't believe it, neither will you, and the book won't work. And God, how many times have you seen Hollywood films where you've got some you know, historical figure using language you would use today so the kids can relate? I call that the Xena warrior princess syndrome. <laughs> and yet, you know, Hollywood doesn't seem to get that. But what my father did is he dared and again, nobody had ever done this before. He dared to put words in the mouth of Robert E. Lee. And if they were, you know, we don't know what Lee said at every moment. That's why it's fiction. People ask me, you know, but your books are historically accurate. Yes, but. You know, there was no recording secretary wandering around following these people. You know, there was no CNN, you know, recording every single minutia, you know, thing that goes on. No. That's the job of the storyteller. We know where these people were. We know what they were doing. We know, can you imagine the agony of the decision for Robert E. Lee at Gettysburg the third day when he orders Pickett's charge? He's ordering 12,000 men to go across a mile of open ground right into the guns of the enemy. He believes they're going to win. They can break through. He has faith in his army. What follows is one of the most catastrophic days of the war for the Confederacy and really the end of Lee's army. It starts a downhill slide from there. Imagine if you, I had people say to me after seeing the film Gettysburg, oh, come on now. You mean to tell me, you know, think about charges. In Hollywood, you know, in war movies, guys are running and screaming and yelling, ah, charge. You know, that's where you see it. Guys on horse, you know, the cavalry, these horses are going, you know, 90 to nothing. Try that on a horse for about five miles. Watch what happens to the horse. Well, try running a mile across open ground carrying a 10-pound musket and a knapsack on your back and uh, see what kind of shape you're in when you finish that mile. You're not going to be in any shape to have a fight. No. They didn't do that. They walked shoulder to shoulder in a line three deep. So there's a, guy, you know, a couple guys behind you. The sergeant's back there griping and cursing, trying to keep everybody in line. The lieutenant right here up front, there's, there's the colonel out there leading the way with his sword in the air. And you walk one step at a time. There's drum, drummers playing. Keep the rhythm. You walk. You know, you're looking. Down the line, keep the line straight. You start walking. You come out of the trees, and you can see it. And there's, you know, it's a long uphill. I've walked this many times. Some of you have too, I know. It's a mile. 
Halfway across is a fence because there's a road. They have to stop, take the rails down to the fence so the guys behind can come on through. Well, while you're starting this walk across this nice, peaceful, open field of grass, the artillery on the other side starts to fire. And you can see the balls. The solid steel shot is coming down across that field, and they're bouncing like bowling balls, and, but you can't get out of the way. And all of a sudden, five guys next to you are gone, just like that. You keep walking. You get over the fence, you start to climb the hill, and you get within 300 yards of the, of the Union lines within musket range. And so now there's a different sound. The sound of a zip and a ping as something goes by your head, musket balls. And suddenly you hear next to you the sound, and this has been written about so many times by the people who were there, the sound of a cracking walnut. That is the sound a musket ball makes when it hits a skull. And the guy next to you goes down. And you keep walking. Now that story and how it ends is a horrific day in the life of the Confederacy. It's a horrific day in the life of America. But it's real. It happened. And what my father did, the magic of the killer angels, is you're right there walking with them. You're walking with General Armistead as he's walking up that hill right toward the guns of his best friend, Winfield Hancock, who's up there waiting for him. And when I was a kid and we went to Gettysburg and I was 12, and my father took me on that walk and he explained to me what happened, told me the story. And you step over, and I know many of you know this, you step over the rocks, the Union Wall, you get up to the hill, the high water mark of the Confederacy, it's called. And you get there, and my father was explaining what was happening, and I'm just awestruck by this. And there's a little marker, a concrete marker about a foot and a half high, that had a Confederate flag sticking out of the ground. Well, that was odd, I mean, we're in the Union lines. You walk around and look at the front of this marker, and it's the place where General Lewis Armistead fell. And my father sees that, and he starts to cry. I'm 12. I've never seen my father cry. He was General Armistead at that moment. That's how involved he was in the story. That's why he could write that story. And it's what made him a magnificent storyteller. Now, I'm very fortunate to have sort of carried on a tradition, I don't know, there's no other word for it, a tradition that he started. And in writing, you know, going, leaving the Civil War, I had my, it used to drive my editor crazy that people would write to my editor and say, oh, we understand you, know, you publish, you know, Jeff Shara and you, you know, handled Michael Shara. Um, you must be the Civil War guy. And my editor would have a fit and he'd say, no, I'm a guy who sells good books. I mean, very nice of him. But I went back and did the American Revolution. And one of my first fears about doing the American Revolution, leaving the Civil War behind, is there a good story here? I mean, you know the character. I know, you know, I know George Washington and Ben Franklin and John and Abigail Adams. And, you know, I mean, I know all that. But is there a story? Or is it just, you know, stuff out of a history textbook? Oh, no. There's a story. It's a phenomenal story. And I was so excited to do that. And moving forward to you know, World War I, I started hearing this marvelous thing from people, which was, I didn't know that. I mean, it's four words. And what, you know, yes, what I just said, yeah, you know George Washington and Benjamin Franklin, you know Robert E. Lee. But when people would come up to me and say, you know, yeah, I studied history in school, but I didn't know this. I didn't know the story. That's the point. I started hearing that, I got very excited. I wanted to find other stories you don't know. Most Americans get their history from Hollywood. Sorry. Um, well, how about, about World War I? Nobody knows the story of World War I. You know how many Hollywood good Hollywood movies have been made about World War I? I can count them on one hand. 
you know, All Quiet on the Western Front, Sergeant York, Paths of Glory, the original Gallipoli. I mean, there's a few bad ones. Um, but I, it's a story nobody tells. Well, I told the story. And the, you know, the Red Baron, I was appalled. How many people thought the Red Baron was just a cartoon character? No, he actually has a name, Manfred von Richthofen. I mean, he's a magnificent character and a three-dimensional human being. He's the German voice in that story. He's a terrific character, and most people have no idea. And this is the man, you know, if you don't know what, who the Red Baron really was, this man shoots down 80 enemy planes, 80, before he meets his own end. And by enemy planes, of course, I mean, you know, <laughs> us. Well, Blackjack Pershing, okay, yeah, there's a name you eh, kind of, you know, you kind of heard of, but I bet you don't know the story and what Pershing accomplished. And I would stand up in front of audiences hoping somebody would argue with me, and it never happened. I would wait for some historian to stand up and, you know, give me this academic stuff. No. What I would say to the crowd is, Blackjack Pershing is the single individual responsible for the Allies winning the war in the West. And I waited for somebody to dispute that, nobody did. Maybe I was right. The Lafayette Escadrille, I mean, what a fabulous, again, if you saw the movie Fly Boys, came out about four or five years ago, you still don't know anything about the Lafayette Escadrille, Hollywood. Well, I wanted to do Korea, same reason. You know what most people in this country know about Korea? MASH. Well, MASH is not about Korea at all. It's about Vietnam. I mean, yeah, it's set in Korea, and they say Korea. It's a Vietnam story. Uh, just look at the haircuts. But Korea, nobody. What about Inchon? What about the Chosun Reservoir, the Yalu River? I mean, these are stories, yeah, maybe you've heard of them. But I bet you don't know the story. I got all excited about this, and my publisher said, well, we kind of want to hear your take on World War II. When I first heard that, I was not the least bit excited. Why? Go back to Hollywood. You know how many movies have been made about World War II? They're making them today. Hundred. Just take the John Wayne movies. I mean, there's the history of World War II right there. What am I going to tell you about World War II you don't know? And then I go back to the lesson of my father, and I go back and I find a character, um, marvelous character, Erwin Rommel, the Desert Fox. He's the German voice in the first two books of that set. And I was nervous about this. This is not like writing about the Red Baron. Rommel's fighting for this guy named Hitler. How do I do that? You know, how do I put words in that guy's mouth? And then I find that this is a much better character than I thought he was. He's not a Nazi. He never is a member of the Nazi party. He's just a good soldier. And his story is a remarkable story, especially since it's Rommel who understands Hitler's crazy. And he actually says, there's, there's a quote from, from Dr. S uh, General Siegfried Westfall, his chief of staff, when Rommel receives an order that is just ludicrous from Berlin, and he tosses it on the ground and says the man is insane. That's the three dimensions. That, that's the third dimension to the character of Rommel that allowed me to get into his head and tell that story. And on and on. I mean, I, the fourth book on the end of the war in the Pacific. I was going to do a trilogy. We decided to do a trilogy set in Europe. Made sense. Publishers like trilogies. There's something about box sets and all this, you know. So trilogies are something they, they really appreciate. Well, I got a letter, a lot of letters from Marines. Europe, what's this Europe crap? We're not in Europe. You know, there's that other war going on, you know, the other side of the world. Yeah, I understand. So I knew, okay, it's not a good idea to get Marines mad at you. So I did a fourth book. Uh, I had to convince Random House to allow me to do a four-book trilogy. <laughs> it worked. So I tell you know, the end of the war in the Pacific, Okinawa and the bomb. Now, 
I don't know what your viewpoint is. I don't care because I don't care what my viewpoint is about the bomb. You talk about something that's treading on thin ice in terms of political correctness and all of that stuff. There are people that think the atomic bomb on Hiroshima was the most catastrophically barbaric thing, you know, we've ever done as a country. And, you know, all of that, I, I know all that, so do you. That really has nothing to do with this story. This is just the guys who were there, Colonel Paul Tibbetts flying the Enola Gay that dropped the bomb, that story, what went into that, and the Japanese side, a doctor in Hiroshima and what he experiences. It's just telling you the story. One thing you will not get in the Killer Angels, politics. You won't get it in any of my books either. I hate politics, which doesn't, you know, kind of makes me want to go hide in a hole right now. Um, but it, I've had people say to me, well, when you write about Eisenhower and Churchill, aren't you really writing about George W. Bush? You know, wink, wink, wink. It's like, no, oh my Lord. If that's what you get out of my books, uh, you know, you're not reading my books. I mean, um, no, you, you should not hear my voice at all. Well, my father did, uh, that's one thing he did differently. If you've seen the film Gettysburg, or if you've read The Killer Angels, there is a character, Buster Kilrain. Buster Kilrain is Joshua Lawrence Chamberlain's, well, sidekick, you'd call him his sergeant, uh, former sergeant Buster Kilrain. And Kilrain is the Irish, sort of crusty Irish uh, character, older man. And he is the cynic. Think about when The Killer Angels was written in the 60s. It took my father seven years to write the book. In the 60s, well, my father, you know, Joshua Chamberlain is a marvelously idealistic man, believes in the goodness of man, believes that there's the peace of the angel in all men. And it is Kilrain who says in the film, well, if man's an angel, he's a killer angel. In the film, that was Ron Maxwell, the screenwriter's, his tribute to my father. He gives you the title of the book. In the book, it's very different than that. But the character of Buster Kilrain is my father. He put himself into the story. He felt like there needed to be a cynic to counter the Chamberlain sort of blind idealism and the actor who portrayed Buster Kilrain, Kevin Conway, who portrayed the, the character in the film, he was really upset because every other actor in the film Gettysburg had a real historical figure to research. <laughs> Kevin Conway did not. <laughs> he had to sort of just go with what he thought my father would want him to do. And he's also very proud of the fact, by the way, that Buster Kilrain is the only principal character in that story who's an enlisted man. Everybody else is an officer. So if those of you who are enlisted men maybe <laughs> appreciate that a little. But the film was 90% of my father's book. You know how rare that is in Hollywood? And, huh, yeah. Um, a lot of people have opinions about Ted Turner. I hear it all the time. Ted Turner's you know, an interesting he's a guy who makes people have opinions. But I will give credit to Ted Turner because without him, I wouldn't be here. Without him, the Killer Angels would never have been made into film. And likely most of you, or at least a good number of you, would never have heard of this. And I, you know, there would be no point to this event. I want to wrap this up by talking about something else a little bit different. Uh, because I very much want to get to your questions. Uh, I mentioned that my father wrote another story. Um, again, nothing historical. You know, he was, at the time of his death, he considered himself a failure. My mother worked for the state of Florida for 37 years to pay the bills because my father could never pay the bills with his writing. At the time of his death, nothing was happening with the Killer Angels. He had gone on to write, again, something else he cared about, and he didn't really care if you cared about it. He wrote a baseball story. He wrote a baseball story at a time when nobody cared about baseball. He couldn't sell it. 
Nobody in New York bought it. At the time of his death, it was an unpublished manuscript. My mother and I were going through his effects, and I found it. And there was one copy left. This was before the days of, you know, save. <laughs> one typewritten manuscript. And in the meantime, baseball had gotten hot. You had Bull Durham and Field of Dreams. Robert, Robert Redford made the natural. All these wonderful baseball stories. Baseball was in fashion again. Again, my father was a master of bad timing. I took the manuscript to New York, got it published, and in 1999, the movie came out. It's called For Love of the Game, with Kevin Costner, Kelly Preston. I'm in it. Don't blink. <laughs> Yankee Stadium, very cool. That is the second time I have been to a movie premiere and this time in New York, the first time in Washington, when, um, you know, sitting there with my mother next to me, gripping my arm like this with the emotion that she's going through, when the lights go down and you see the credits come up on the screen based on the novel by Michael Shara, twice I have seen that that he did not live to see. I take very seriously that no matter what I do, no matter how many books I write, or how many audiences I speak to, or how many bestsellers, or any of that stuff, um, that I can never replace the legacy that he left me, and the legacy that he left you. How, you know, I wonder, and not that it's, you don't need to reveal this, how, but I just wonder how many of you are even here, or have any interest in the Civil War at all, because you read a book called The Killer Angels. And that's what this is about. I meet people all the time who say, I hated history in school. You know, I got, last thing in the world I wanted to do was pick up a book on war. Somebody handed me a copy of The Killer Angels, like, oh, I don't want to read this. And I started reading it. Now I'm taking my kids to Gettysburg. I hear that a lot. Well, all I say to wrap this up is, I freely acknowledge to you, and always will, no matter what happens to me, that I am walking in enormous footsteps. Thank you. Questions? Yes, we do have some questions, Jeff. Somebody actually asked a question. Thank you. Yeah, some people <laughs> asked a question. Very embarrassing when nobody asks a question. Uh, we have a couple from the back that we wanted to start with. Uh, your dad wrote about the Battle of Gettysburg, and uh, it is always referred to as the turning point of the Civil War. Uh, of course, that's come under scrutiny lately, what really is. Now, with your research and all the books you know, that either you've written, you've handled the Eastern Theater, you're now into the Western Theater, so you're the man to ask here. Do you truly see that battle as the turning point? And if it isn't, what is? Or maybe there's no one answer. There is no one answer. I mean, there are, a, I mean, I could give you four or five real quick ones. The death of Stonewall Jackson, the death of Albert Sidney Johnston, which is what my last book was about, the Battle of Shiloh. That changed to me, that changed the course of history. Um, the, uh, the death of Lincoln, in some ways, changed the way the war played out in terms of how we live it today. I live in Tallahassee, Florida. I'm from New Jersey. When I was in first grade at six years old and went into school and people were calling me a Yankee, I didn't know, and with, with hostility behind it, I didn't even know what that was. Well, it, you know, there are people still fighting that war. The death of Lincoln is responsible for some of that. The Battle of Antietam, the scene where I'm going tomorrow. I'll be there the, the 150th anniversary, um, the single bloodiest day in American history. A lot of people say that's the turning point of the war. Uh, I mean, the war, the, Shelby Foote said, the North went into the war with one hand tied behind its back. 
In other words, in the union never used the amount of resources they could have used to bring the fight into the South. I mean, they, the factories were never, it was not like in the South where every resource was geared toward the war. It was never that way in the North. And just the wealth of men they could have drawn upon to the Union Army was never, uh, was never needed. Uh, so as bloody as the war was, it was pretty much doomed from the start uh, for the Confederacy, it, but certain things, and like I say, Albert Sidney Johnston, Gettysburg, Antietam, and Stonewall Jackson, those four really sealed the fate, okay. in my opinion, for what it's worth. Thank you, Jeff. Uh, by the way, someone is collecting the cards, so if you have a question, um, we need the cards up there, uh, or I'm afraid they won't, they won't be attended to. Uh, can you describe a moment, Jeff, uh, when the research that you did for a book uh, caused you great emotion, if not moved to tears? Oh, boy. Yeah, um, the first one, I mean, there are several. Uh, actually, uh, uh, I'll, I'll give it away anyway. Well, the first one was the death of Stonewall Jackson. You know, Stonewall Jackson is not in the Killer Angels because he wasn't around at the Battle of Gettysburg. Um, and when I was researching and decided to use Jackson as a character, what I've discovered in writing any of these characters and getting into their heads, all the things I described about, you know, daring to put words in the mouths of these characters, you have to hear the voices. You have to go back. It's all original source material. Diaries, memoirs, collections of letters, the accounts of the people who were there. And feel like, you know, I have to be comfortable putting words in the mouths of a character or it's not going to work. And the only way to do that is to feel like I know them. And the inevitability of dealing with Stonewall Jackson, and I knew this from the very beginning, at some point is going to come that day when I have to write the chapter where I kill him. That I was, well, frankly, I was bawling. I mean, I, you know, there's no other way to put it. It was incredibly emotional. I went through exactly the same thing, and this may strike you as odd. I went through exactly the same thing with the death of the Red Baron. I loved this man, and I had to write his death. And I mean, so that's probably the, the toughest part is the history is what it is. I'm not changing history. You know, the characters are who they are, and there comes, there comes tragedy. And having to deal with that tragedy is a very emotional thing for me. And I hope that translates in the book, and that's hopefully that's why the book works. I mean, the death of Lewis Armistead uh, toward the end of Killer Angels very definitely affected my father. I know exactly what he was going through. Uh, Jeff, this person might have, must have been a mind reader. You were making your comments about Lincoln as being one of the turning points of the war. Uh, their question is, what if Lincoln had served an entire second term? Would anything have been different? Oh, yeah. I mean, for one thing, Lincoln was very aware. Uh, there's a single word that applies to Lincoln that he got that would have changed everything. Healing. Lincoln understood what had to happen for this nation to heal. And some of the Union generals did as well. In fact, some of the, the James Longstreet understood this, which is why he became a Republican and tried to, you know, get people to come back. And he was just vilified for it in the South. Still is from a lot of people. But Lincoln understood that we are one nation and we've had a horrible catastrophe we have to get past this. And had Lincoln lived, Reconstruction would not have happened the way it did. Again, this is my opinion. I mean, I'm not the ultimate authority. No, nobody is. But in fact, um, Reconstruction, you know, right up until when Grant becomes president in 1868, um, I think the entire history of this nation would have changed had Lincoln lived. It would have been a very different country. Thank you. This is quite a, a simple, probably, but a profound question. Why did, did your dad entitle the book Killer Angels? It is in an early Chamberlain chapter um, where he, I, I mentioned where the title comes in the movie, where it's sort of given to you as a tribute to my father. Um, in the book, he talks about, Chamberlain talks about a conversation that he has with his father. His father being the sort of crusty old guy, um, and it's Chamberlain talks about um, 
something from Shakespeare about, uh, and I, I'm, I'm not a Shakespeare person, uh, so I'm, you know, mess up the quote, but it's, you know, the, uh, how, how much is man like an angel in design? Okay, that's the paraphrase. Well, Chamberlain quotes this to his father, and his father says, well, if man's an angel, he's a murdering angel. And Chamberlain thinks about that. Man, the killer angel. That's in the book. Well, <clears throat> my father taught Shakespeare at Florida State. He knew Shakespeare. It, it's not a direct quote from Shakespeare, but that's where it comes from. I mean, from Hamlet. Okay. <clears throat> Jeff, this person would like you to take us back to when you were young around the Shara dinner table. What were the, uh, what were the evening dinner conversations about at that table with your dad? To if call it a conversation would be inaccurate. <laughs> um, pretty, pretty one way. <laughs> it, we, were, we were the audience and he was the you know, speaker. Um, and very much, well, I described some of that. I mean, it was, uh, when, there was a problem with my father and talking about him uh, in that this was a very unhappy man in a lot of ways. This man, he suffered from what we know now as clinical depression. Uh, he never did anything about it. And he would go through these bouts of writer's block and boy, knock on wood, it's not happened to me, but the writer's block would be devastating to him. He would go through months when he would stare at the typewriter and nothing, I mean, you know, no computer, nothing would come out. And we had to deal with that as a family too, and that was not pleasant. But then when things were happening, he was the most vivacious, personality-filled man you can imagine. Again, the storyteller. You know, he understood the creative writing, where writing is not about technique and gimmicks and all that, with all due respect to people who teach it, because I know you have to teach it somehow, and it's not about, you know, he hated it when somebody would analyze, break down some of his books. Well, let's consider the symbolism in chapter six as, you know, he hated that stuff because that's not what he was trying to do. He was just trying to tell you a story. Well, that's what, what we would get in the good times, is we would get those stories. Thank you, Jeff. <clears throat> Why has a civil war, this particularly, uh, this question comes from a person who's lived in the South. Uh, they identified themselves as living in the, having had lived in the South. Why has a civil war, and still particularly does a civil war, uh, continue to involve us intellectually, emotionally, and viscerally through, through today's Yeah, I, I get asked this a lot, and uh, I, I mean, I've thought about it, and there is no single answer to this, but I will tell you, first of all, it's our war. Nobody else was involved. As much as the Confederacy wanted the British to be involved, they weren't. And it's our war. We did it to each other. We killed more of each other than we have killed in all the rest of our wars combined. And the fact that in the South they lost, the fact that so much of the South was devastated, um, the fact that, you know, we have ancestry. I mean, I have been, I've spoken in front of the Sons of Confederate Veterans groups, Sons of Union Veterans, and when they say it, that's not a figurative description. <clears throat> they're the sons of the veterans. I mean, they're the great, great grandsons. It's a, <clears throat> it's a very visceral thing. It's an emotional thing. Excuse me. <clears throat> My apologies. <clears throat> it's My that voice. dry California air that you have. <clears throat> yeah. <clears throat> That's all right. My voice goes. <clears throat> but it is, it's our war. And I don't have a better answer. Okay. Uh, Jeff, we talked about this a little bit backstage, um, but uh, someone here would like to know about it. Can you uh, describe your cameo in Gods and Generals? <laughs> <laughs> apparently they know you were in it, and you told me you were in it, but... Uh, Do I have to? <laughs> uh, this won't take long, apparently. <laughs> uh, there is a scene, in the, and, and, I've, and, and I don't want to get deeply into this because I say things that get me in trouble. I am not a huge fan of the film gods and generals. I had nothing to do with the script, nothing to do with the production. That surprises people when they hear that sometimes, but that's the nature of the business in Hollywood. Um, the, I said before, the Killer Angels, about 90% of the Killer Angels is the film Gettysburg. I mean, my father would have been very happy with that. Gods and Generals, about 15% of my book, and the rest of it is somebody else's thing. 
Well, welcome to Hollywood. There is a scene in the film <clears throat> that much resembles a USO show. Hurrah, hurrah for Southern rights, hurrah, hurrah for the Bonnie Blue flag that wears a single star. I had to sing that freaking song all day long. <laughs> that scene, it's, again, it's, like a, it's an actual historically accurate. The guy who wrote Bonnie Blue Flag, he and his wife, would travel around and do a minstrel show and entertain the Confederate troops. It's accurate. And <clears throat> we had to film that from 9 in the morning until 4.30 in the afternoon. She had to, because they had to shoot it from you know, 50 different angles and to get the smoke right and all that stuff. <coughs> Excuse me. Yeah. And I'm in the scene and I'm sitting there next to the Reverend Tucker Lacey. Uh, it's, the only reason they did the scene is to give Ted Turner something to do. <laughs> He's in the scene, it's his scene. If you see Ted Turner, you miss me. I'm about... <laughs> A few seconds before Ted is on the screen, big, stupid-looking mustache, <clears throat> and I'm happily singing away Bonnie Blue Flag, and for weeks after that, that song was in my head. I could not get Bonnie, and now that I've sung it to you, I'll probably, you know, all night I'll be singing it. Would, would you like me to ask the audience to give you a rendition to take no. home? Or... <laughs> no. Follow the bouncing ball. Were you in Gettysburg? No. No, oh, okay. Uh, that, that, that somewhat leads to a, a couple of people here, maybe three people actually have asked um, when or if either the last full measure will be made into a film or any of your other books. Are there any projects on the slate? And somebody here specifically wanted to know if Ken Burns uh, has, has uh, approached you about any project. No, I actually, I know Ken. Um, I, we're, I wouldn't say we're friends, but I, I've met Ken on a couple of occasions. Um, and no, he, he's a documentarian. He doesn't really do what I do, and it's, it's a whole different kind of a thing. I would love to work with Ken, but that would have to come from him. Um, as, for, as far as last full measure, because I get this question everywhere I go, Ted Turner said he, would be, he wanted to finish the trilogy, make the third film. All he wanted to do was break even on Gods and Generals. He lost $30 million. He dropped the option, that was the end of that. Nobody else has shown any interest. Now, of course, Ted is out of the movie business altogether. It's all Warner Brothers now. I mean, Ted's, you know, they literally threw him out. And so he has nothing to do with any of that anymore. Warner Brothers owns the rights to Gettysburg and Gods and Generals, and they could care less. Um, and I have no clout with those people. <clears throat> I've talked to a couple of the actors. Now, I can't name names because they wouldn't want me to, but they realize that they're getting too old. They couldn't do it now anyway. It would have to be different actors. That causes new problems. Um, and ultimately, it boils down to money. It always boils down to money in Hollywood. You're talking about a film. Gods and Generals cost $60 million to make. Today, you know, this is what, 10 years later, you'd spend $100 million. Well, unless, you know, you want to pass the hat, you know, we can give it a shot, but <clears throat> That's the problem right there, as it comes down to money. As far as any of my other books, there are some, there's talk, um, <clears throat> good talk. You know, I like talk. Um, <laughs> however, I've also learned that when people talk in Hollywood, you don't sit by the phone and wait for them to call back. Um, and so right now, nothing actively is happening, but people are talking. I mean, I'm, I'm, that, that's, uh, that's good. And in fact, a couple of actors who you would know actually have talked <clears throat> about the new Civil War books I'm working on now, we'll see. No, not, nothing, nothing's on paper yet. Okay, thank you, Jeff. Um, the, um, this person here wants to know, how far in the past does a war have to be before you'll consider writing about it? Uh, <coughs> <laughs> that funny well, it would is. help, it would be helpful if the war was over. <laughs> right. um, I mean, I, and, and I say that facetiously, but in fact, I have, I mean, a lot of, I, <clears throat> I hear from a lot of soldiers and Marines in Afghanistan and Iraq. Uh, my books are being read over, and it's wonderful. I've actually shipped books over there, um, and I hear from these people all the time through my website. It's magnificent. Uh, but I, people ask me that. Well, you need to tell the story of what's happening in Afghanistan. Well, yeah, and, okay, but it needs to, that needs to be in the past, and it's not in the past, it's in the present. And the other part of that is, 
I, I belly ache before about politics. It would even be difficult writing about Vietnam because of the politics. And, and, and I mean, I've talked to a lot of Vietnam vets. That's my era. I mean, a lot of Vietnam vets have contacted me and, I, and with some fabulous stuff. And that's, that really is down the road, something I really want to do. What I will not do is the LBJ Nixon Westmoreland McNamara story. Who cares? Well, maybe a lot of people care. I don't. That's not the story I want to do. I want to go with the grunts. I want to go out in the bush. I've heard from the brown water Navy guys, the guys who went up the rivers in the small boats, who went where they weren't supposed to go. And you know, a bunch of those guys have contacted me. I mean, that's the kind of story I would like to tell. Um, but Vietnam is probably about as far forward as I would go. Jeff, as you travel around the country and go on book signings and, and presentations like this, you get a chance to talk to a lot of not only parents, but probably students. Can you give us a general uh, uh, litmus reading, if you will, on how you feel the American education system is doing with teaching history and are we going in the right direction? And, 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 <laughs> and, and maybe some of the funny questions you've been asked that you probably didn't think should have been asked, but they were Oh funny. no, I, that's, not what I'm, that's not why I make a face. Yeah, I know. <clears throat> Because you know the answer to the question yeah, I already. I, I do, um, but it was asked. So. <laughs> and and, 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 and for all, in all due respect to any history teachers here, and I know there are some, um, and it's not your fault because, you know, curricula are decided not by the teachers usually. It's decided by school boards and states and all of that. History is not being taught. I mean, all you got to do is look at these surveys they take where they ask, you know, a thousand high school kids, who won the Civil War? Huh. You might get 20% even know what the Civil War is. Who fought in the Civil War? I mean, it, it's, it's appalling, uh, the, the lack. And you know, a part of it, and I'm not going to get into the politics of this, because it, it, that's, again, that's not what I do. But part of it's political correctness. You know, we can't talk about George. I, I had somebody say this to me. I wrote two books, George Washington as a character. We need to get George Washington out of our history books. He owns slaves. Well, yes, he did. And no, I am not condoning slavery. But he did other things, too. And that's really kind of the story. The other part of this, and again, getting away from touchy subjects, Hollywood lately, there have been a couple things, on HBO or something, about Benjamin Franklin. He's been portrayed <clears throat> as a dirty old man. That's like the overarching theme about Benjamin Franklin, is he was a dirty old man. Well, good for him. <laughs> but, but excuse me, Benjamin Franklin is responsible for the colonies defeating the British. You know why? <clears throat> because he seduced the French. Seduced is a good word. King Louis, he convinced King Louis to come into the war on our side. He did that. If he hadn't done that, we would have lost. We were losing the war. The British were the finest army and navy in the world. And we're, what are we? A bunch of shopkeepers and farmers. With a guy named George Washington who believes himself to be clearly out of his element trying to form an army. And we work. It works. And Franklin is the first man responsible for that. Washington is the second. I challenge you to find an 11th grader who knows that. And that's really, that makes me terribly sad. Because if we lose touch with where we came from, we lose everything. We lose who we are. And, you know, and I could rant about that, and I've, I've said enough. But, um, it's really unfortunate, and I've met a lot of, te a lot of teachers, um, I met one tonight, um, using my books in their classroom to teach the subject. Because if you can give the kid a character that he can put a face on and relate to, they'll learn the history in spite of themselves. It actually works. And I've heard, I had other teachers say, you can't possibly teach history using a novel, like with outrage, <laughs> whatever. Well, I hate to see how your students are going to turn out. But anyway, that's enough of the rant. But I, I, think, you get, I think you get the point of where I stand on this issue. Yeah. Well, go ahead and have a sip of water here while I ask this question. We, we have about 10 minutes left, folks. So if you, if you have your questions that come in, what's that? 
I need a scotch. Is what there you go. Should. Okay. <laughs> yeah, forget the questions. Does someone have a scotch for Mr. Shara? Um, you, you told an interesting story at dinner about the casting behind the scenes, the casting of Lee, uh, and, it, and, it, and it crossed over between both movies, the Gods and Generals in Gettysburg, and maybe the audience would get a kick out of hearing that behind behind the scenes story of casting. Yeah, they, a lot of people. I've heard grief all over the place about Martin Sheen's portrayal of Robert E. Lee. And I understand, I mean, you know, there were, Robert Duvall was a better Lee. <clears throat> I mean, 99 and three quarter percent of the people who saw the films think that. Um, he was Lee to some of the reenactors. It was amazing on the set what he looked like and how he acted. Robert Duvall was always supposed to be Lee in Gettysburg. He had just finished Lonesome Dove and he was exhausted and he begged off three weeks before production was supposed to begin. So of course the producers are in, at Turner are in a panic. Tom Berenger was friends with Martin Sheen, brought him in. Sheen had never ridden a horse before. He said, I'm a Mexican American. What do I know about Robert E. Lee? <laughs> well, they taught him how to ride a horse. They gave him a three week crash course and if you don't care for his portrayal of Lee, I understand, and I understand all the reasons why, but I cut the guy some slack. And, you know, that, that he pulled it off, given what he had to work with. And, um, of course, then in, in Gods and Generals, Duvall does come on and, and portray Lee. And, uh, but, I mean, like I say, I've heard so much criticism of Martin Sheen. When you know a little bit of how it all came to pass, it, it really makes it a little better. Thank you. Jeff, do you know your schedule far enough out? This person wants to know if you intend to be at the big uh, Gettysburg 150th next summer. And also, uh, we did mention you're going to Antietam uh, this uh, a couple hours. Um, but can you project uh, a year or so in the, and say, you know, are you going to other 150ths or have they, they have these various battlefields asked you to be there? Or what, what's your publisher got in store for you? Yeah, it's. I, uh, the answer about Gettysburg is absolutely. I'll be there for a week um, because the Park Service, it's interesting what's happening next year. I mean, Antietam's going to be big. And Antietam is the big one this year for the reenactment community. Now, I don't know how many thousands of reenactment, uh, reenactors are going to be there this weekend. I have no idea. I'll find out when I get there. I'm going to be under a tent signing books for you know days. But <clears throat> Gettysburg, the Park Service is doing something on the actual anniversary of the battle, July 1st, 2nd, and 3rd. But the way the weekend falls, the reenactment will follow that. So it's going to spread out for a full week. It should be a monster. And I say that in a positive way. I mean, this is going to be possibly the largest reenactment. I mean, I was at the 135th, and there were 25,000 reenactors. Think about that. They did a full scale Pickett's Charge. Yeah, they filmed it. Yeah, there's a DVD of it. That was pretty cool. Um, I would imagine the same thing will hold true next year. I have no idea what my, beyond definitely being in Gettysburg next year, there's no way for me to say right now. A lot of it has to do with what, and one thing I didn't talk about here tonight is what I'm working on. Um, what, you know, my last book came out about the Battle of Shiloh, came out in 2012, the 150th anniversary of Shiloh. My next one is Vicksburg coming out next spring. I love this. I haven't finished writing the manuscript yet. Random House has it in their catalog. <clears throat> <laughs> Which is a leap of faith on their part. <clears throat> and then after that, I mean, I'll follow with, I'm following Sherman primarily um, with, of course, not, not just Sherman. If I followed just Sherman, nobody south of Maryland would buy the book. <laughs> and, um, <laughs> I, I, I know your audience, you know, so, um, but, I, you know, I, I never can predict in advance where I'm going to be uh, more than a couple months ahead, but I'm pretty sure um, any of the larger reenactments, I, I don't know what Appomattox is going to be like in 2015. What are they going to do? That I, I don't know. I don't know who's planning that or what they might be doing. Um, I have no idea, but that, that could be, a, I mean, that would be a really interesting place to be. Uh, in 2015 for the 150th of the end of the war. Also, the 150th of the Gettysburg Address is a year from November, 14 months from now. 
that will be impressive. Um, I've actually given the talk where Abraham Lincoln stood at the cemetery. Um, I did it about four years ago. It was about 10 degrees and I was hypothermic, but, um, and I mean, and it's, that's, that's a big deal. You had a couple thousand people in the cemetery and it's really special. Um, that one, I don't know who, I mean, it's possible the President of the United States would give the talk, uh, depending on who it is. Um, but I mean, that, that, that's the kind of caliber of, of event that will be, you know, the 150th of the Gettysburg Address. And I hope every school kid in this country has to memorize it. You know, that, that, I really hope that. But so, that, there's no, well, thank you. Jeff, two more questions. Um, this one relates to the characters. You carried the Adams brothers through a couple of the World War II novels. Those of us who are reading Blaze of Glory, without giving away the plot, um, do you plan on carrying any of the characters forward through the end of the war in the Western theater? <laughs> the plot is the Battle of Vicksburg. Right. <laughs> we know how it ends, but <laughs> the how about the characters? Of Vicksburg. I mean, I don't change the history. Um, I, I, I just have to tell you, I got a review of my second book on the American Revolution from the Christian Science Monitor. They, they do a really good book reviews there. Really nice review. I mean, it was a top notch, they were full of praise. And, um, but they, they kept using the word suspense. <laughs> this is the end of the Revolutionary War. My question was, <clears throat> do you not know how it ends? <laughs> So in terms of plot, I mean, I'm sorry for all you Confederates out there, but you lose at Vicksburg. <laughs> um, what was the question? <laughs> are, you, are you thinking about, you don't have to commit maybe, but are you thinking about carrying oh, any, yes. any of the characters forward from yes. Blaze of Glory? Yes, if you've read uh, A Blaze of Glory, the, the character of Fritz <laughs> Bauer, the 16th Wisconsin duchy. Dutchy Bauer uh, is, continues on. When the clue to this is if, and, and this is only, uh, those of you who have not read any of my books, I mean, this is not gonna mean anything to you. But in all my books, there's an afterward. <clears throat> and I, what I do, and I've had a lot of people have commented positively on this, so I keep doing it, that what the afterward does, it takes each of the characters, the, some of the minor characters, and it ties up the loose ends. It tells you what happened to them the rest of their lives. Well, when I leave somebody out, that's a clue. He's <laughs> he'll be in the next book. So, so that's it. So you know we have Grant and Sherman, and you know we have John Pemberton on the Confederate side. And I will tell you, this is the first time ever that I am writing one of the voices in this in this story is a civilian woman in Vicksburg, and what it's like for those people. And I've got a character there, because I've got some marvelous diaries. And, uh, but, I'm, but I'm right in the middle of this manuscript. I mean, it, my head is Vicksburg right now. Everything is in my brain is Vicksburg, um, and because I've got to finish this thing by the end of December. Um, <coughs> so what am I doing here? But <laughs> <laughs> one, question, one more question, Jeff, and we'll, of all the genres you've written about, uh, the period, the time periods, I should say, um, do you have a favorite? I'm asked this a lot, and my answer is a little strange. Um, the period of time that I'm in love with is the period of time I'm writing right now. And that's been true through 12 books. It has to be that way. If I, because I get so immersed and so involved in, again, the character, not the event, the characters. And I love the characters, and they consume me. And just like John Pemberton and Sherman and Fritz Bauer um, and Lucy Spence are consuming me right now, this is my favorite era to write about. And it's that way through, and, and if it wasn't that way, I probably need to quit. I mean, the books, the books will reflect that, you'll know. And, but that's the way I feel, and as long as I keep feeling that way, I keep writing books. Well, Jeff, your, uh, your enthusiasm this evening as a speaker uh, certainly for me resonates through the pages uh, and it's nice to put the, the author with the real person and, and just to see your, your passion and your, uh, your fervor for what you write about uh, makes your books, uh, they were already, but they're even that much more honest to me. Well, so I like what I'd I like do. to, uh, can, we, can we give Jeff another warm Northern California welcome? <laughs>